Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father, through our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text is our epistle reading from Philippians chapter 3, which ends with this verse, actually chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, my brothers, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, that is how you should stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. This is the word of the Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, Happy St. Patrick's Day. Now, maybe I'm unaware of it, but it seems that down here St. Patrick's Day is a little more low-key than in some other places of the country where there might be a heavier Irish population. For example, while, while we were driving in this morning from our home, um, as we were going past the Memorial City Mall area, we noticed that all of the neon was green, which is pretty nice, but not quite the same as up in the Windy City where they dye the Chicago River green. I don't think they dyed the Buffalo Bayou this weekend, did they? No. Okay, so, so yeah, maybe St. Patrick's Day isn't as big a thing down here as it might be up in the northern states. And even in the church, while, while in our Lutheran church we do regard the saints and we recognize saint days, St. Patrick really isn't on our radar all that much. So we don't even have the proper paraments to put on the altar or the pulpit or the lectern. Um, our altar guild doesn't have St. Patrick's Day paraments. But today is St. Patrick's Day. And I do have a really cool tie that I bought a few months ago in anticipation of St. Patrick's Day. And then I realized St. Patrick's Day was a Sunday and I don't wear ties on Sunday. But we'll still make use of our little St. Patrick pyramid right there. So in honor of our friend St. Patrick, there we go. Well, who was this St. Patrick character after all? He lived in the fifth century. He grew up in Britain. And at the age of 16, he was taken captive by Irish pirates and taken to Ireland where he was sold into slavery. And for six years he was a slave in Ireland until he escaped and returned to Britain. Well, there he had some legal issues that he thought were probably taken care of or forgotten, but they weren't and he ended up in prison. After he got out of prison, he became a priest. And because the folks in Britain were not, were not all that impressed with him and his character, he went back to Ireland, the land where he had been a slave, for the express purpose of being a missionary to the people of Ireland. And eventually he became the bishop of Ireland. In his own autobiography, he says it was during those years of his enslavement in Ireland that his faith was profoundly affected. So much so that he would return to the land where he had been a slave to bring the message of Jesus Christ to the people who lived there. I think St. Paul would have liked St. Patrick. St. Paul urges us to stand firm in the Lord, and I think we could say St. Patrick did that. He stood firm in the Lord during his six years of being a slave in Ireland. He stood firm in the Lord as he dealt with legal problems back in Britain, and he stood firm in the Lord as he brought the gospel message of Jesus Christ to the people of Ireland and taught and baptized thousands of people and was used by God to bring Christianity to the people who lived in Ireland. He stood firm in the Lord. I think St. Paul would have liked him because St. Paul, as he writes to the Philippians, is busy standing firm in the Lord himself as Paul writes to the Philippians, he is under Roman guard. 
not free to come and go as he pleases, probably under house arrest, but still the Roman government had set their sights on Paul. And yet in that situation, Paul writes his letter to the Philippians, what is often referred to as his epistle of joy, because of how many times in this letter Paul urges us to rejoice in the Lord and to find joy in our salvation, even though he himself was under Roman guard. And so he tells the Philippians, and he tells us to stand firm in the Lord, beloved friends. Well, how do we go about that? What does Paul mean? We need to look at the previous verses right before our text to see what Paul has in mind, how he expects us to stand firm in the Lord. And he begins by saying, join with others in following my example, brothers, and take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. In other words, Paul assures us and, and encourages us to stand firm in the Lord in how we follow the example of the saints. Paul tells these Philippians, many of whom were young in the faith, to follow his example and the example of others who live the way Paul has been teaching them to live. Follow the example of those who are mature in the faith. And that's an important message for us today. It's an important message for those who are younger in the faith to look to the example of those who are the veterans of the faith for current generations to look at their parents or their grandparents. Now, they might look at their parents and grandparents and say, well, they're not too cell phone savvy. And when my grandpa hears about something going viral, he thinks he needs to go to his doctor so he doesn't get sick. Well, yeah, those older generations may not be as tech savvy as the younger generations might be, but they are faith savvy. And they are salvation savvy. And it does well for younger generations to look to parents and grandparents who have lived through more and who have had their faith sustain them through more. We need to look at those who are spiritually mature so that we can navigate the challenges of life in this day and age, to look to those generations who have lived through different experiences, but hard experiences nonetheless, and whose faith has carried them through and has, has shaped and tempered them into people of faith well into their 70s, 80s, and 90s. And those of you who might be in your 70s, 80s, or 90s, you also look to others who have maybe had similar experiences, li lived through similar eras in our history, and you can encourage each other as you face challenges that come with aging as we mature in our bodies, but also as we mature in our faith. So we stand firm in looking to the examples of others those who have gone before us and are now with the Lord, those who are still among us as living examples of what faith in Jesus Christ can do for a person through the challenges of this life. Stand firm, Paul would say, in looking to the example of others. And as we do so, we quickly realize that those who live as Jesus has taught them to live find themselves at odds with the world in which we live. Paul even recognizes this and he says, as I've often told you before, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach and their glory is in their shame. In short, their mind is on earthly things. And we see that today. 
many people living for what today offers with giving no thought to an afterlife, no thought to, to a heaven or a hell, just what is ever going on today. In fact, well, this, this phrase is no longer that current, but not too many years ago. It used to be YOLO, you only live once. And that kind of became the excuse to do whatever you want because you only get one ride. May as well make the most of it. And that became a rationale and a justification for doing all sorts of things because after all, you only live once. Focus on today. Focus on, on the things of this world. And Paul would say, don't do that. We have much more important things to focus on than simply the things of this world, the things of this day. And Paul warns us to stand firm against that notion of being earthly minded. Unfortunately, because we do live in a world, we're influenced by that world. And even within the church we are. And sometimes a church can become earthly minded. When a church becomes earthly minded, it becomes crippled in its mission and ministry. One way a church becomes earthly minded is to be survival minded. When a church is survival minded, it's not focusing on ministry and mission, it's focusing on money and members. Those are churches that fear for the future and think we need to get more members in the church so that we can have more, more money in the offering plate and that we can survive for another X number of years. And when a church becomes survival-minded, no longer cares about its mission, it just cares about itself. And ministry and mission get crippled. But does a church need to worry or fear for its future? Is that what Jesus wants us to do? The Jesus who said, don't worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink or what you're going to wear. Your father knows what you need. He'll provide it for you, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these other things will be added to you. Well, what Jesus says to each of us individually, he says to his church as well. That the church's goal is to seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness and everything else will be taken care of. Do we really need to worry about whether or not what we need is too big for God to provide. So we do not need to be survival minded. But along with being survival minded, congregations can also become inwardly focused, if you will. Focused in on themselves. An inwardly focused church is a church that does what its members prefer at all costs. It's a church that for all practical purposes, has the mission of satisfying the saved rather than seeking the lost. But Jesus never said we were here to satisfy the saved. That's not what he came to do. He came to seek and to save the lost. And that's what he has given his church the responsibility to do as well. To sometimes do things that we don't prefer for the sake of reaching those who are not a part of the family of God, not a part of the church of Jesus Christ. To be outwardly focused rather than inwardly focused. When we are mission-minded and outwardly focused, then our concern isn't members and money. Our concern is mission and ministry. So Paul warns us that we are to stand firm against those tendencies to be having our minds set on earthly things, but rather to set our minds upon God and his kingdom and the work he's entrusted to us. 
The reason we don't have to be so focused on earthly things is we know that, that this life is not all that there is. Paul reminds us that our citizenship is in heaven. That this life is not all that we have been promised. I was talking with my son this past week and he's, he made the comment that, that we kind of discussed at length, but he made the comment that sometimes he feels like going through this life is just the price of admission to get to heaven. And that you just have to endure all of this because of what is waiting for us. And I said, well, there is, there is an element of truth to that and that this life is not all that we have been promised. We are promised a much greater life. Paul says it here. Our citizenship is in heaven. That doesn't mean that in this life we have no meaning or no purpose. That we're just going through the grind until we go to heaven. No, we certainly do have a meaning and a purpose here. The same meaning and purpose that Jesus had. When Jesus described his purpose for being here, he said, The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And that really becomes our meaning and purpose as we go through what is admittedly sometimes the grind of this life. We are called to serve others. And to find meaning in that service. In whatever form it might take. How we care for our own family members. How we care for the people who live around us. How we as a church care for the people who live around us in our neighborhood and even beyond that. That's our purpose for being here. We also are here not to be served but to serve. But Jesus did something that we are not called to do. He went on to say, that he came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That was the measure of his service. That he sacrificed his life for you and for me and for all when he went to the cross of Calvary. That was his service to this world. Redeeming this world and atoning for the sins of this world. And we follow in his footsteps as we serve those around us in whatever capacity we are able to. Because our citizenship is in heaven. We have a greater purpose for our existence than simply going through the grind. But sometimes life is a grind. We can't deny that. We can't deny that because we are broken people living in a broken world, that sometimes it is a grind. Sometimes there is hardship and there is suffering. Even in those circumstances, Paul would say, stand firm. He says, we eagerly await a Savior from heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. In other words, even though we are in the middle of Lent, we are to live as the people of Easter. We are to live as the people who put their faith in the one who has defeated death in the grave, the one who rose from the grave glorified, and the one who will return on the last day to raise us from the dead, after all, we confess faith in the resurrection of the body. He will raise us from the dead. But no longer in these bodies that, that are shackled by sin and its corruption, but rather in bodies that are liberated from sin and that share in his own glory. It is that hope that sustains us through the grind of this life where there is sometimes suffering and sometimes hardship. It is that hope of Easter that keeps us moving forward. And so Paul would say, stand firm in that, in that Easter resurrection hope, which will be fulfilled when our Savior Jesus Christ returns for us and transforms us into the people that we were meant to be. 
So stand firm, Paul says. Paul stood firm in his faith and in his Lord during his times of suffering, during his times of challenge. St. Patrick stood firm in the Lord during his enslavery and during his mission work in Ireland. Our Lord Jesus stood firm as he stood before the Sanhedrin and before Pontius Pilate and before the Roman soldiers who put him on the cross. Jesus stood firm in his trust in his heavenly Father. And he stood firm in his commitment to you and me. And so we are encouraged likewise to stand firm. To stand firm as we look at the examples of those who live as Jesus would have them live. To stand firm against all those temptations to be worldly and earthly minded in how we do our lives. To stand firm as citizens of heaven. And to stand firm as the people of Easter whose hearts are filled with resurrection hope. Yes, we hear those words of Paul. Stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. Amen. And may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.